this is Ben Chuele. Today I'm talking to you about the Icelandic language. Uh, why should you learn that language? Hey, hit that subscribe button, it really helps the channel. This is part of a three-part series, so this is the third episode. I did one on Danish, Norwegian, and Swedish, which I'll put here, and I did one on the West Germanic languages, German and Dutch, and Afrikaans, which I'll put here. I don't know if they'll go in the right order, but there you go. Icelandic is spoken by around 314,000 people, give or take, in Iceland. So here you have the Germanic languages, and it's part of the North branch. It's a bit further removed from Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish, which are more like each other, and Icelandic has really gone on its own way. It's incredibly unique because it's evolved in its own path without too much external influence. Can you hear the wind blowing outside? Icelandic is an incredibly unique language. It's by far the most conservative of the Germanic languages. It is basically Old Norse taken into the 21st century. One thing that makes Icelandic so unique is that the Icelandic people are one of the few people today who moved into a country that has never been inhabited by other people and founded a new settlement and those same people without other people truly taking over have existed there to this day so from about the year 870 to about the year 930 you had the first true settlements in iceland and that viking era then grew and christianity came in and then what you had then was one of the great cultural gifts of i i say the world the icelandic sagas the icelandic sagas are basically like a monolith of medieval literature that reads like a modern novel almost of different families settling in Iceland and the stories of their people and no culture that I have come across quite has something this modern and thick from like the 13th century and that time. If you're interested in medieval Europe, yeah, Norwegian's interesting, but Iceland is phenomenal. There's nothing quite like it. To this day, they have amongst the highest number of writers per head of population in the world. These are intensely literate and literary people. Their language is much more complicated grammatically because of its remote isolation on this far off island and the uniqueness of the land, all these volcanoes and earthquakes and so on has shaped the Icelandic language in ways that's a bit different from Germanic, the continent. They've come up with new words out of the old Norse language roots for new ideas like computer. Let me just run through a few of those now to show you how unique this language is. The first one, Stjörnuspeki. And this comes from Stjörna, meaning star, plus speki, meaning wisdom. Don't quote my pronunciation of these. And so star wisdom literally is the word for astrology. That's really cool rather than just taking it from Greek. And then you get the word for investing is fjarfesting, which means fjar, property, plus festing, to fasten. So investing in something is fastening down your property, making it go farther. I like the word for a mobile phone in Icelandic, or a cell phone if you want to be colonial. And take a look at this, far simi. And the first bit, far, comes from fjor, Old Norse for journey, plus simi, meaning telephone, which comes from a word meaning cord. A mobile phone in Icelandic literally means journey phone. One more. The word for evaporation is really interesting. Upgufin. I don't know if I pronounced that right. It's composed of up with two p's and gufin, meaning steam, so up steam. What I find so unique as well, from a Welsh perspective, looking at Icelandic, is this is a country 
you know, the Iceland rather, is a country of fewer people than live in the capital city of Wales and Cardiff. We're talking less than 350,000 people, and yet they have everything in their language. They produce films every year, multiple television stations, all the labels and shops often are in Icelandic, radio, internet. Yes, they do tend to speak English as well, but everything you could ever want is available in Icelandic. We Welsh could really do with having everything in our language and have it be expected that way. And it shows what you can do if you have the boldness of settling a new land and declaring it yours. That's the confidence it's given them as a people, I think. And it shows in a resilient way in their language as well by adopting new concepts like microscope or bogia is another one of those Icelandic words created from its own roots. So you get ur, which is fast, and bogia, wave, and making them words in their language. The Icelandic alphabet has most of the letters that we have, and most of them are pronounced the same way. But there are two letters which you're not going to find in English. This old letter here, which makes a th sound. One important word that has this letter is the all thing. The oldest continuous parliament in the world. In this building behind me. So that's pretty cool that they have that in their country. The all thing was established in the year 930. And with only a brief intermission in the early 1800s, it's kept going that whole time. And this letter here, the, which makes another kind of th sound. And Icelandic is like the Welsh language in the fact that it differentiates the two th sounds that you would get, for instance, in with and feather, or this, as opposed to plinth. Those two th sounds in those words are a bit different, and Icelandic makes a clear distinction between the two is completely different, like Welsh does. Th and double D. But in Icelandic, D with a cross through it, and this letter here, which I think that looks pretty cool. A way to say thank you in the Icelandic language is Fakathir And hey, hit that like button. Fakathir Languages are gateways. Icelandic is a gateway into the Norse language. It's not the same language. The Norse language, as I mentioned, broke up. But what Icelandic is, is it's a continuation off of one dialect of that language, the far western bit. And it progressed relatively undisturbed by other languages. Though there is a bit from Danish and some sprinkling of Dutch. But on the whole, Icelandic's quite conservative and uninfiltrated by lots of other languages. Partially because it recycles stems from its own sources and Norse to create new words, but also its geographic isolation. And because of this, it's a different language, yes, but it's so deeply woven into Icelandic from the Viking Age, especially in the early period of Icelandic, which makes it incredibly rich in terms of its literary culture and knowing where it comes from as a people. Its origins are very clear and its identity is very strong because of how much its language connects it to its own past. Icelandic is the only Germanic language which has preserved and conserved word initial consonant clusters. What do I mean by that? Well, have a look at these here. H, L, H, R, and H, N in these three words. Hjof. This is a cognate with the word loud in English. It means sound in Icelandic. But that H at the beginning, that's been dropped off in the other Germanic languages. HR you'll find in a lot of words in Icelandic at the beginning. So, Raf, this is Raven, and in English the H has obviously been lost a long time ago. And the word for nut in English, you see the H in front of the N in Icelandic, which is a very conservative construct, and it makes it really unique as a language that it's kept those in many, many of its words. 
Icelandic is an SVO language, mostly, meaning I through the ball is the general structure of how the sentences are formed. However, the Icelandic language is a case system based language, which I'll get to later on, meaning that the word order can change more freely in some instances because the endings are going to change depending on what or who the object is or other cases. Embarrassingly, I don't know much about Icelandic culture. I wish I knew more, but I know from Björk and the landscape that I've seen in images and videos of Iceland, it is stunningly beautiful and probably worth learning just to see that and live there with those people. It's world renowned for its modern music like Sigur Rós. And I think this comes from them having to live on this island with no plan B. They have to succeed and flourish. I think this self-dependence, this independence, this not just taking other cultures and depending upon them, but depending upon the roots of your own culture is what I find most interesting in many cases about the Icelandic language. So let's look at the case system in brief because this is so different. And if you're going to learn this language, you need to know that this exists beforehand to prepare yourself. So you know what I'm talking about with these couple examples that I'm going to give you here without having to explain as much. Just some couple bits for you here. Icelandic has no indefinite article. What do I mean by that? That means a or an. So an apple and a Georgian mansion. And it's definite articles, it attaches to the end of the words, like this one. In English, we would say the garden and the moon. That doesn't work like that in Icelandic. So the word for garden in Icelandic is garður. But if you want to say the garden, garðurinn. Just a moon is tungli. But if it's the moon, tunglið. And just to compare that with the indefinite article, meaning a something, a house, they don't have that. So you don't have to worry about that. Icelandic has three genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter. The masculine endings are usually, but not limited to, ur, e, double l, and double n. And the feminine endings are, but not limited to, a, ing, and un. The neuter kind of ignores the endings and doesn't really follow those rules as much, but you don't need to know that for now. So what about the case system? How does this work? Icelandic has four cases. Nominative, which, all right, I'm gonna go through the names of these just to show you what they mean because in grammar, people use fancy names and it's like, why are you gonna use these? Just call them what they are. So nominative means the name of it. That's one case. Accusative literally means who's got stuff done to them, right? So, doing, right? And then dative is like movement. And then the genitive case is ownership. So just remember that when I use these words. These four cases change according to three different genders, the masculine, feminine, and neuter. And they also change according to be definite or indefinite, like I showed you with the articles. And they also change according to how many, singular or plural. Here's a sentence. David Gafeni supuna ur storu scalini. David gave her a soup from the big bowl. And so David is in the nominative, it's just the name of who he is and that's not been changed but her if it was not changed or being given to it would be whom here but it changes to henny and sapuna is interesting because if it was the soup it would be supu but it's supuna meaning a soup so it changes depending on which one it is ur means it's a preposition, it means for or out of. And what I mean by a preposition is just a short word that connects stuff, right? And then storu skalin is literally the big bowl, but the endings have been changed. If it was 
the ball, it would be Stora. If it was the big ball, it would be Stora Stalina. But it changes because it's in the dative case into that U ending and the I. Here, let's look at another one quickly. Bain hun sins eribatnum. This means the dog's bone is in the boat. Bain is bone, it's not been changed, but hun sins, check this out, hunderin is the dog. But there's that double S in there because it's in the genitive form. It's being owned by. And then eri is, is in. And then batnum in the boat. The boat would just be baturin. But it's in the dative form, so it changes. In a boat, again, that definite and indefinite thing changes things, is ibot. Everything's gonna change according to the specific needs of the grammar. Case system languages are really fascinating because it enables you, if you're not gonna say whole sentences, to convey lots of meaning just by small bits that you throw out there to imply the rest of the sentence. And that's a flexibility non-case languages might not be able to give you. And I think it would enable poetry as well to be much more nuanced in some instances. That's quite brief on the case system, but I don't wanna be heavy on the grammar with you. I hope you see that it's culturally a powerhouse for such a small language. It's got a lot going for it, and the epic beauty of their island is astounding from just any Google search you can see. I hope I get the privilege of seeing this country in my lifetime. But also its cultural connections to the rest of Scandinavia, and it's kind of an intermediary between the future of creating new language and words and the past of a Viking heritage. And I really like that sense of almost like a time frontier that Iceland is in, which is quite unlike anything in the world. I hope you get some broad understanding of the Germanic languages now and what makes each one, well, worth learning. They all are worth learning, absolutely. And whatever your journey with language, you should know that it's the culture of a people that makes the language worth learning. Not how many people speak it, or not really how useful it is, but what you get enriched to you as a human being. That's what makes a language worth learning. Hey, Dio Khanbar Mulio, and we'll see you in the next episode.